other newer and re-improved drugs, maybe, and you guys can sit back and kick it on autopilot because I probably will not ask you a question over these two individual agents because they've only been out for a year and I haven't even used them um, because they are so expensive and our patients simply can't afford them. First one is levomilnasoprin. You guys might have heard of Savella or Milnasoprin. It's a medication used to manage neuropathic pain. This is the levo version, which is supposedly better for depression has a very heavy norepi component to it, which makes it a little bit unique, but side effects and everything, just think of it as an SNRI. Uh, it does have a lot of drug interactions associated with it. You guys are familiar with 3A4, CYP3A4, which everything and their mother goes through. This is a big player into that, so it requires a lot of dosage adjustments. Um, the other one is Vortioxetine, Brintelex. This is a medication I was actually pretty excited about because it's the first what we call multimodal antidepressant, where you can see it has a whole bunch of mechanisms of action where it's working on serotonin 1A, 1B, it's a partial agonist, it you know, works on 1D, works on 7. Um, you know, you can get this same combination by putting on about three or four other drugs, but this was kind of an all-in-one package. Uh, they put a price tag on it to boot with that, so again, I don't have any clinical experience with this particular drug. Not, not many people are using it because not a lot of insurance plans will even pay for it, and it's like 300-something bucks for a month's supply on it. Um, it's another one that requires a lot of dosage adjustments, so there's a lot of drug interaction components with it as well. Uh, but side effects wise, it's fairly well tolerated, very low incidence of sexual dysfunction. Other than that, it functions very similar side effect wise to an SSRI. So looking at all of these, this is everything that we talked about. Differentiating between these can be very, very, very difficult. What questions do you guys have? Yes? Actually, you can. If it was an anaphylactic reaction, like a true anaphylactic reaction, I'd be very apprehensive, you know, but it's like penicillin cephalosporin type stuff. If you have a penicillin reaction, you can be on a cephalosporin. There's some cross-reactivity there, like 5%. It's about the same with these. And actually, non-response to one SSRI doesn't mean you won't do well on another SSRI. Does that answer your question? Good one. Anybody else? Yes, sir. So looking up drug interactions, uh, you know, you guys probably have access, you guys have up-to-date access. You can run drug interactions on there through Lexi, which is a pretty, pretty accurate one. Uh, there's also Micromedics when you're working through the university. Micromedics on a desktop is far and wide the best, in my opinion, because of real good discussion. Pulls up real blank, here's the interaction, point blank, one or two sentences about it. The other ones tend to give you pages of information to sift through to, to find out what you're needing. Those are probably my two favorite um, ones to look for. Anything else? Okay. We need to kind of keep moving. I'll let you guys look at this. This is just a figure I put together which really illustrates the, what I call the R's of depression as far as response and remission um, to give you an idea of, of what those look at. So response in a depression trial we say is a 50% reduction in baseline symptoms. Remission is an almost complete alleviation of those symptoms. Um, then I also have the acute continuation and maintenance on there. That's just recommendations from the APA, practice guidelines, which were updated back in 2010. Uh, they recommend that anybody who's initiated on an antidepressant be continued for another four to nine months. Reason being is when we used to do symptom control and take people off, over half the people were back in the hospital a year later. When we continued with treatment, only 15% were back in the hospital within a year from there. Uh, maintenance treatment, this is lifelong therapy, candidates for that if you have a lot of stressors at home, if you've had multiple episodes, um, or if it's just patient preference, or if you had a very severe first episode that almost ended in the, in the completion of a suicide. Symptom resolution, you'll notice we change things very quickly on an inpatient side. Um, we don't wait, we don't have, you know, three to six weeks to wait to make sure that these are going to be in full effect. We can look at some things along the way. We usually notice changes in sleep and appetite pretty quickly within the first, first few days to a week. Um, beyond that, we'll start seeing improvements in energy, concentration. We'll notice sleep and appetite getting back to baseline. And then, unfortunately, that four to eight weeks later, that's when we start to see the, the resolution of guilt, the alleviation of the suicidal the ideation. The stuff we want to fix first gets fixed last. But a lot of times, we can look at these as somewhat surrogate markers to know that at least we're on the right path. Serotonin syndrome, um, I want you guys to kind of read through this. This is pretty, pretty 
encompassing on what you might need to know about it. But it is a direct result of putting too much serotonin into the system, right? So we see a triad of symptoms, mental status changes, autonomic hyperactivity, and neuromuscular abnormalities. There's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful article out there called The Serotonin Syndrome. It was published in uh, New England Journal of Medicine in 2005. It's still the standard article on the issue because not much has changed in the management of serotonin syndrome. Uh, but this is a figure I yanked out of that. Just for those of you who are visual learners, you can kind of see some of the progression of the illness. So things that you're looking for, the sweating, the agitation, the tremulousness. In serotonin syndrome, everything is activated. Serotonin is an activating chemical. So you see jitteringness, you see shaking, you see tremor. Usually if you see tremor, it's more in the legs. It may be legs only versus arms. If it's legs and arms, it's usually worse in the legs. You see things like hyperreflexia, clonus, which is this seizure type jerking movement. Um, mild cases, which we think are probably more common than people would recognize. Presentation is very quick. Most people have symptoms within the first six hours. Virtually all cases of serotonin syndrome happen within the first 24 hours of the dosage adjustment or starting the medication which precipitated it. Uh, those, those progress into a moderate case where you start seeing a little bit of that autonomic hyperactivity, the temperature fluctuations, and then we get up into the severe cases where we have very high temperature elevations. Things to think about, I'm not going to go through this list, but these are serotonergic medications. Some of these are very obvious, like other antidepressants. Some of these are not so obvious, like illicit substances or over-the-counter medications, like dextromethorphan. All have serotonergic components to them. <clears throat> 